Hi everyone, welcome to the Machine Learning Meetup. Today we have a talk by Drew Jagel, who's from DeepMind. He's going to be talking to us about perceivers. Um, I'm Martin Goodson from Evolution AI. They, they're sponsors of the meetup, um, joined by my colleague uh, Alessio, I'm also from Evolution AI. Um, I'm going to hand over very, uh, in, in just a few seconds to Drew, but just so you, you know the, the rules and the format in case you haven't been here to the meetup before. We're going to use the QA function for uh, any questions that you have, and we're going to leave the questions. Uh, you, you can put your questions in during Drew's talk. He'll be talking for about 40 minutes, and then we'll come back to your question at the end of, uh, end of Drew's talk, and we'll have a 20-minute discussion. Um, so don't use the chat for QA. Uh, you can use the chat to, to, if you have any questions of, the, of, of, the, of us, of the organizers, but otherwise just use the QA for asking your questions, and also raise your hand if you want to ask your question yourself. Otherwise, we'll read out your question. But it's much more fun if people read out their own questions. So do raise your hand and we'll unmute you so you can, so you can do that. And so now I'm going to hand you over to Drew. Thanks, Drew. Uh, thanks, Martin. And uh, thanks, uh, Martin and the other organizers for inviting me. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about um, some recent work that I've been doing uh, with, with colleagues at DeepMinds, uh, at DeepMind to develop um, perceivers, um, which we, we've, we think of as, um, as basically a, a candidate for a general purpose neural network architecture that can really be used um, on, on essentially any domain. Uh, so before we before we sort of get into the details of how these work and and how we um, how we actually design general purpose architectures, um, first I just want to set the stage of why we are interested in building general purpose architectures in the first place. Um, so at DeepMind, um, our goal really is to develop uh, systems that can be used to produce an intelligent behavior in essentially any domain that humans uh, care about, and this includes um, domains that that have. Uh, what we consider sort of more traditional perceptual, sensory perceptual modalities and uh, things like text as well. But uh, some of these can be quite exotic. So uh, ranging all the way from uh, some from very fine touch sensors to, uh, to next generation uh, cameras, um, as well as things like uh, olfaction. And, so, and uh, so each of these domains basically have data that uh, reflects the natural world, but does it in a very different way from many of the sort of, the, the sort of domains that we've been very successful at developing developing architectures for. So we can't use straightforward 2D or 3D convolutional networks for many of these domains. And so if we want to approach them, the sort of standard technique of developing a new architecture that has an inductive bias that's appropriate for new type of data just really won't work. Uh, the problem becomes even more severe when we think about uh, data that that is sensory and perceptual at a certain level of description, but isn't uh, isn't well described by our sort of normal intuitive experience of the world. And this is a reasonable way to, to view basically all of this, the data that's being uh, that's captured by scientific instrumentation. And so as we want to develop systems that can cope with all of the new data that we're getting to measure our world, so to be able to reason about it, to make predictions about it, we'll need architectures that can handle all of these. And if we were to engage in a process of developing a new architecture for each of these, we'd find ourselves um, having to redo basic work over and over and over again as we uh, discovered new domains. And so rather than going about it this way, we want to build architectures that can handle all of this essentially out of the box. So that's really the goal of this, uh, of this line of work. And um, the, the, the place that we looked for this was uh, basically attention. So attention, which is the basic of, uh, the basis, the basic oper um, uh, the basic uh, minimal operation of uh, transformer based architectures um, has proven to be very versatile and very effective. Um, and these days it's, it's basically in use uh, essentially everywhere you look, whether this is training large language like models um, to, to perform uh, code generation, whether it's uh, to predict accurate protein structure um, in, in the context of the AlphaFold um, series of, of architectures, um, whether it's to develop um, few shot models that can, that can reason about images uh, and video, or whether it's uh, reasoning about uh, the kinds of uh, sequ sequential decision uh, making processes that you have to engage in in reinforcement learning. So the same sorts of architectures um, work, work generally everywhere, uh, but there's a big problem with transformers and that's um, that they don't scale um, to very large inputs. And the reason for this is that uh, basically um, transformers um, take 
they perform a quadratic operation on each of the input points to um, using a self-attention operation that looks at each of the points um, as pairs and then pr performs further computation on these um, to, to produce a transformation of an input set here shown in green to an output show, uh, set shown in yellow. So at its core, um, each of these attention layers, so when you build a deep transformer, you st stack a bunch of these blocks, self-attention and MLPs being the, the sort of the essential operations here. And you end up with scaling that's quadratic in the input size. So M here is the number of points um, and L is the, the depth of the architecture. So we have a coupling between this quadratic scaling and the input size and depth, which makes this worse as we get bigger and bigger inputs and as we get deeper and deeper networks. Um, and even if we ignore the attention and just focus on the MLP, we see that there's still a linear coupling between the input size and the depth. And in practice for large language models, this latter um, constraint is the one that's the, the dominating one. So we tend to be memory bound uh, by just the, 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 the pure fact of the MLP layers that we have. And so both of these problems make it very difficult to scale the kinds of transformer models that we see in large language models to very large inputs. Um, and as a result of this, um, we end up having to uh, either truncate the, the size of the inputs that we're passing into the network or um, go uh, or go to a bunch of different means to figure out ways to sort of compress the input so that the architecture can deal with it. Um, and so in, in the perceiver line of work um, to, to build general purpose architectures, we wanted to solve this problem of how we could um, retain all of the, the beneficial properties of transformers, but scale them to much larger inputs. And the way that we go about this is by exploiting the structure of the, of the attention operation to decouple the input size from the processing, uh, the requirements of processing. So the way that this works um, is uh, we can look at this if we, if we first um, sort of look through the basics of how self-attention works. And so the way that self-attention works um, at, a, at a high level is we take um, some input, which can be viewed as a 2D array. So this can be uh, a series of tokens where uh, it, the indices is the number of tokens and the channels would be the, the vocabulary size of the tokens that you're looking at. It could also be um, just a raw image where the indices are the pixels and the channels would be the RGB values associated with each of those pixels. We then process it using a 1D convolution. So this gives us three output arrays, the query, key, and value array. And each of these has the same size as the input. We then, um, using uh, a matrix multiplication, we then compute a, an attention map, which is M by M. So where M, is, again, is the number, the number of input points that we have. And we finally, we use this to, um, to reproject the, the, um, the values to produce output features, which again are of size M by C. And so um, you'll, you'll notice here that um, the input and the output size of this operation are the same. And we have this M by M bottle uh, with this M by M uh, very expensive uh, attention map right in the middle of it. So this makes a uh, scaling prohibitive beyond, uh, beyond uh, even quite reasonable sizes. So you can't build a deep transformer um, that, that even the, on ImageNet scale uh, images because of this, this sort of retention of the size all the way through. So rather than maintaining the size in the attention operation, we introduce um, a learned uh, latent array, which you can think of these as weights. Um, and each of these basically is Seems like we've lost Drew. Let me message him. Okay, let's give Drew a couple of minutes. Maybe there's a problem with his connection. Attention, the complexity of self-attention oh, from really. quadratic to linear in the input size, which is um, absolutely crucial when you're talking about very, very large inputs like images or videos. Um, and we've produced outputs that are much smaller than the input. So in the case of images, we can map from a 50,000 dimensional input um, to something that's a thousand dimensional. And we find in practice that this uh, still allows you to produce very, very expressive architectures, but at a fraction of the cost. And so using this basic operation, we can, um, we can build uh, the perceiver 
Uh, sorry. Uh, the uh, so the, the um, in... we've lost your. Um, I think there may. I don't know if there's a problem with your internet connection, but we've lost your slides now, and we lo we actually lost your audio for about a minute. Oh, did you? And my internet should be fine. Let me let me just represent here. Sorry about that. And I can let you know roughly where we where we got up to. Um, okay, I'm not. Okay, are you back with me? Can you see the slides now? Yeah. So maybe if you go back, we basically got up to the quadratic m by m. Oh, so you've you've lost me for a couple of minutes. Yeah, you were you were gone for a while. So we got to the end of this slide. Okay. Um, great. So, um, so because of this, um, the quadratic complexity and the um, the output size being the same same as the input, these these um, these architectures work very very poorly for um, for very large inputs. So, um, as a way to deal to to um, to get around this, we replace um, self attention with a latent cross attention. And um, the way that this works is we um, we introduce a learned latent array, which is n by d, and you can think of these basically as being um, very much like RNN initial states. Um, they function as weights. Oh, so you can't see my face. No, we can't see your face, but we can see the slides. So. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. So so um, th these are basically um, these are. Um, uh, vectors in in a latent space that we then use to uh, project um, the the that we use to replace the um, the input um, so that we can uh, as the output of the op, um, the attention we end up with um, an attention matrix that's um, of shape n by m rather than m uh, m squared and so this um, this is already um, relieving the um, the 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 um, quadratic uh, complexity of the attention operation itself and finally by reapplying this to the um, to the values, we get an output now that's of size n by d. So this is um, this is a way to um, basically flexibly control the output size of um, an attention operation and to um, to uh, get rid of the uh, the quadratic complexity that we have in uh, in the computation of the attention map itself normally. And so as a consequence of this, um, we've produced an operation that's now linear in the input size, and perhaps more importantly, the output is now of a shape that we can control. And so this basically um, allows us to build very deep uh, transformers on top of this output, because now um, their their complexity will be quadratic in terms of the smaller uh, smaller size n rather than m. And so this allows us basically to have more flexibility in how we design these architectures and allows us to use them on much larger uh, inputs. And so um, uh, using this um, this basic principle, we can um, we can produce the perceiver I/O architecture. And so the way that this works is we take um, a large input array. So this can be uh, this can be images, this can be uh, video, this can be a, t a text. Or, and so M is going to be the number of tokens or the number of input positions, and C is the number of channels. We um, attend over this with a latent array, and the latent array size is um, is a hyperparameter. So we can choose this based on the compute and memory requirements of the task at hand. Uh, its output again is n by d, and we then apply a deep stack of attention layers on top of this to further process this. And because this is on um, a, an n by d array rather than m by c, the um, the scaling of this is independent of the input size, which allows us to build very deep architectures even on very large uh, very large inputs. To produce the output, we can then flip this operation. So using the latents as inputs as, as key and value inputs to um, a cross attention and querying with an output query array. And so this output query array is basically um, consists of vectors, each of which specifies the semantics of the point that's being decoded. So for example, we can use this um, to decode classification by using a single vector to query the class of the, the logits vector. We can also use this for dense reconstruction tasks by querying uh, the, the output decoder with um, po uh, points that uh, each of which corresponds to one of the pixels or one of the elements in the output. So just to see how this works, um, if we're um, if we're considering a very simple autoencoding problem, so we'll take the image, we encode it, we process it, and then to decode, we query it with um, position encodings, each of which specifies one of the points in the output. And by doing this for all of the points, uh, each of which has a different position encoding, we can produce um, we can end up, uh, we can in parallelize this computation um, and allow us to generate um, arbitrary uh, uh, outputs with arbitrary size and semantics.
And so we can push this um, well beyond um, just uh, imagery construction. Um, for example, to do multimodal autoencoding. So here um, we have uh, some input video. So this is audio, video, and then a class label. So the input looks like this, basically. Start at the outer corner, I swirl, and I move in, and then I move back out. And you keep doing this until... And then the output that's produced by the model. And so this is an architecture that's, um, that's basically given raw audio, video, and a class label, um, compressing it all at once, and then decoding it. Start at the outer corner, I swirl, and I move in, and then I move back out. And you keep doing this... And so you can see it's not in this case it's not perfectly reconstructing the input of the or um, the input but it's it's grabbing the gist and the the thing to highlight here is that um, the number of outputs that are being decoded here is eight hundred thousand so the video and audio and label are all being decoded in parallel um, whereas in a normal transformer the typical output length that you can cope with is around ten thousand so this is basically an architecture that can that can handle very very diverse um, and high dimensional multimodal data um, with with no problem. And so we can apply this architecture to um, a number of, um, of interesting problems. Um, so one of, um, one of these is optical flow. And optical flow is a, is a long-standing problem in computer vision, where um, basically given a pair of input frames, we're asked to estimate the motion between each of the pixels, so each of the points um, in that first frame from the first to the second. And uh, these are typically visualized um, using this, the, one of these legends that's shown here. And so um, what, what's shown in the legend is basically that the intensity of the, um, of the color gives you um, the velocity, the, so the speed of each of the points. And the hue tells you um, the orientation of it. So you can see that Sintel, who's this, uh, this character in the middle, is roughly moving to the right and down. So um, just to contrast, um, the reason that we uh, we uh, we applied this to flow was because flow is um is a is a subfield of computer vision that contains some of the most complicated um, architectures. So just for comparison, um, this is the 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 model that won the um, best paper award at ECCV a couple of years ago called Raft, and it includes a ton of specializations for flow specifically. So including forty correlation volumes um, in space and time, uh, specialized um, upsampling operations. Um, a, a bunch of local neighborhood gather operations, all of which are designed to, um, to, to specify the specific problem of flow. Um, on the other hand, when we apply Perceiver I.O. to this, we take two input frames, we concatenate them, we extract a very simple patch from them just to reduce the input size, and then we pass it into the architecture. So this is um, all of the pre-processing that's done here, and we're using this very generic architecture. Um, and to, to, go, to decode from this, we just we use um, we query based on each of the points as well as the RGB value that's specified at each of the points. And this gives us our, our output flow array. And so if we compare this quantitatively to um, on the standard benchmarks in optical flow, which are the Centel data set um, and Kitty, which is a self-driving car um, data set, we can see that um, that Perceiver I.O. Um, is state of the art on Centel um, on both on both splits that are used for evaluation. So here lower is better. So we're evaluating essentially the, um, the, the reconstruction error of the flow. And um, we can see that it's comparable as well on Kitty. Um, and so this suggests that a very, very generic um, architecture um, of this kind can outperform a very specialized architectures. And another thing to point out here is that this is trained on the exact with the exact same data and the exact same protocol as Raft. So this is a this is a fair a fair comparison. Um, we can also visualize the flow that um, that uh, that the model produces um, on real world data. So um, uh, something to point out here. So um, if you look very closely on this uh, uh, on this image, you can see that. Um, the model is able to resolve um, single water droplets, the motion of single water droplets, um, uh, quite reasonably. And this is because um, the architecture decodes um, at the level of individual pixels. So there's no convolutional upsampling in the decoder, which is sort of a standard approach that would be used in, um, in optical flow. But it's, it's rather it's decoding at the level of the individual pixels themselves, which allows it to be used for very high resolution uh, outputs. We can use the same model on um, on problems in language. So this is um, this is basically um, uh, we're going to be using a perceiver I/O with different hyperparameters, but the overall overall architecture is exactly the same. And to apply this to, um, to language, we pre-train it with, in, with mass language modeling. And so this is the same procedure that's used in BERT. Um, and we do this we pre-train first on a on a large scale uh, corpus of um, of as from C4 in English, Wikipedia. So this is all um, this is English. And the way that this works, um, mass language modeling, is we mask um, some, some uh, segment of the input, 
with some probability. We then um, decode at the positions that are masked and we train the model to reconstruct the, um, the missing, the masked out uh, characters in the input. To fine tune this, to evaluate it, we take the same model and we replace the decoder um, with a new one that's trained for um, all of the tasks of the GLUE benchmark. And so GLUE is a multi data set um, of a standard evaluation benchmark in language, which in, uh, includes a variety of tasks um, that, uh, of classification tasks that test for the sentiment or entailment of pairs of sentences. And so this is just a general way to probe um, how much a, a given model has learned about the structure of language. And what we find is that if we compare um, Perceiver IO to the standard BERT base model um, at match flops, we see that um, on glue, on glue evaluation, Perceiver IO and BERT match. So um, the thing to point out here is so the parameter, you'll notice that the depth and the parameter counts differ. This is because we were matching things in terms of the real compute that they took. So um, the depth of a perceiver IO model, um, so each of the layers is much cheaper than the depth of a, of a BERT model. And so you can have many, many more layers, but it still be the same uh, computational cost. And so we see that per, uh, perceiver IO matches BERT um, in a setting where BERT uh, works well, which is when we're using tokenizers. But if we remove the tokenizer, so this will increase the, the, um, the length of input sequences by a factor of about four. And so we can see if we keep the same compute budget, um, BERT has to be much smaller because it, it scales quite poorly with the input size. But if we, um, if we compare perceiver IO in the same setting, so now you'll notice that the, um, the, the, the number of parameters and the depth are essentially the same, um, at the same at the same compute cost. And this is because of the much better uh, scaling with input size. And so you can see that while perceiver IO maintains the same performance with or without tokenizers, a BERT at match compute does much worse. Um, and uh, this, this um, the, the actual, uh, we match things in terms of flops here, but if you look at the actual training time, uh, so, so the, the, the amount of time it takes to do a single forward and backward pass, we can see that perceiver IO from bytes is about is um, is three to four times faster than um, than BERT in the comparable um, in a comparable setting. So this is a model that basically um, can be used um, in a variety of domains, um, and it's much much less sensitive to um, the input size, which uh, which is what allows it to be used on much larger inputs. Um, so I'll be skipping um, some of the other results that we have in in the perceiver IO paper. So um, so refer to those paper if uh, that paper if you're interested in that. But basically the same architecture can be used to um, to get uh, performance um, in the mid 80s on ImageNet without using any 2D convolutions or patches. So unlike other um, other sort of vision transformer architectures, um, and um, the same architecture can be plugged in to replace the transformer and Alpha Star, and we were able to match the performance there um, at reduced flops um, using only, running only three experiments, whereas typically you would expect dozens to hundreds of experiments to tune a new architecture there. Um, so now I'll be talking about um, some extensions uh, that we've made to the, per the original perceiver um, to, uh, to allow it to be used for long-term uh, generation. And so in, um, in generation, um, uh, maybe even more than other sort of settings, um, uh, long-term context is really important for understanding the structure of the scene. So if you imagine that you're trying to generate this image, uh, pixel or patch by patch, um, when you're trying to, to produce uh, image, uh, the, the region of the image that's shown in red here, the, the clear thing that you should do is look back at where the blue, um, the, the content of the blue patch and copy it. In order to do this, you actually have to, um, you have to be able to, to see the, the, um, the content in the blue patch when you're predicting the red patch. And so in practice, when we're approaching these sorts of problems for generation, so if we're generate, generating the sequence uh, 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 position by position, um, because of uh, transformers have this limitation in terms of their scaling, the usual way that we approach it is by using just a limited window. So preventing the transformer from actually contextualizing on the things that, that came well before it and only looking at a local context. Um, but where, what we'd actually like to do is contextualize on everything that came before. And so to do this, we basically wanted to bring over the ideas that made um, Perceiver and Perceiver IO work, um, work very well, but apply them for autoregressive generation. And so the way that we do this um, is by um, uh, taking a standard decoder only transformer, which works as follows. So we, um, we have, um, if we're trying to, um, to model um, some input sequence, what we do is um, add a ca use causally masked self-attention to ensure that when we're making a prediction, so for example, when, when we're going from little r to big A, we can only contextualize on the things that come before it. And um, this, this masking proceeds all the way through the architecture. 
um, the, the usual way, uh, so the usual way that people add more context here is um, is uh, in in uh, in this transformer Excel paper is by um, by expanding the context using a stop gradient to make sure that the model um, is is able to um, look to longer regions of time, but we're not back back propagating to those. And this gives us a way around the um, the sort of the the bottleneck induced by very long inputs by restricting the model um, with the mo what regions the model is training at, but allowing it to contextualize on longer periods. But instead of taking that approach in the perceiver AR work, we um, allow the model to contextualize on a very, very large input using a causally masked cross attention while keeping a causally masked self attention through the rest of the layers. And this allows us to contextualize on, on um, a very large number of inputs in the past, but to, um, to still keep causal self attention all the way through. And to look at this in a little more detail, um, the architecture basically looks like this. So if, um, if the full context that we're using, using is, is shown by the yellow and the red, um, we, want to make, um, we want to make predictions over the region that's just shown in red. And so what we do is we use the full input sequence as inputs to the keys and values. And so this, um, this is basically working in the same way as the cross attention in the, um, in the perceiver IO work. Um, and then we condition the queries using the last inputs. Um, and so um, this will, uh, by using a, a causally masked um, attention, we can ensure that each of these queries in, in, um, in the recent past is only able to, to attend to things um, that, are, that, that precede it in the sequence. And uh, by doing this, um, we're, um, so th effectively the way this works is that the big A will only see um, the letters that, that precede it, um, and it will be uh, trained to predict the letter that immediately follows it in this setting. Um, the consequence of this is that the latents produced by this architecture are autoregressively ordered, um, and they can be used in the same way that um, a decoder-only transformer would be used. And so after we have these latents, we can then process it with a causal self-attention stack. And this allows us to basically um, use decoder-only style uh, causal masking, um, except for this original layer, which follows this cross-attention procedure. And the, um, the net result of this is an architecture that has um, complexity um, for the full self-attention stack that's independent of the input size. Um, so um, to see exactly how this works, um, the, the, the sort of the upside of this in terms of the compute requirements of this model, um, I'll compare this to the Transformer and Transform Transformer XL, which are the standard decoder-only models that people use for large-scale generative modeling. And so we see that um, a transformer, um, if we look at um, if we look at the the the, um, the compute, so the training steps steps per second, as a function of the input context length and the number of layers, we can see that even for quite relatively short uh, context lengths, um, the, uh, the a model very quickly runs out of memory. Uh, this is on a standard four by four slice of of, um, of uh, TPU v3. And we can see that um, with um, even with uh, six layers here, that um, the, the model becomes very slow at quite at, at reasonable context lengths. And if you try to extend it to, to larger context lengths, it runs out of memory. Uh, for Transformer XL, the, the story is a little bit better. So we can scale um, uh, uh, relatively shallow networks to, um, to bigger context lengths, but there's not a dramatic improvement in the performance. Whereas for um, Perceiver AR, um, we, can, we can scale um, because the, the um, the depth and, and the input size are essentially independent. We can scale even very large networks um, to quite large contexts. And so in practice in our experiments, we're able to get the context length up to around 100,000 um, using um, architectures that are about 30 layers in depth um, on our hardware. And so um, the, the result of this is an architecture that um, uh, produces state-of-the-art results on several, um, several uh, density estimation benchmarks, including uh, ImageNet 64 by 64. And so this is basically um, an art, uh, a channel by channel prediction um, uh, network. So the overall the overall length of this is around twenty thousand, uh, so twenty thousand tokens to um, to contextualize on the full um, on the full uh, image to produce each um, uh, each sample. And what we find is that um, because the network is able to condition on the full image when it's predicting each pixel, um, we're able to recover performance that's comparable to state of the art diffusion models on, on this data set. And so diffusion models by design are able to look at the full input, but by making an autoregressive architecture that can do the same thing, we can recover the performance um, in, in terms of in log likelihood terms. Um, we also find that we're able to produce um, state-of-the-art results on uh, the Project Gutenberg uh, benchmark um, for a long, uh, this is book, a book length modeling data set. And so um, we, uh, on, in terms of test perplexity, we're several, um, several uh, points below um, uh, the previous uh, baseline models. 
And um, we find that um, uh, if we uh, do a fair comparison in terms of um, in terms of compute um, versus a transformer Excel model, that we're able to consistently outperform um, the architecture, uh, so we're consistently able to get lower eval perplexity, which suggests this isn't just um, this isn't just a property of changes in the hyperparameters, but really is um, has to do with increasing the context length. So we find that um, at match context, um, the uh, Perceiver AR performs slightly better than Transformer XL, but as we increase the context length, uh, Perceiver AR performs even better. Um, so uh, as the eval, so the eval perplexity goes down. Um, we can also um, use this uh, the same model um, to um, to produce um, on on um, to produce sampled audio and sampled music on um, on uh, standard MIDI based data sets. And so this is quite interesting because um, we know that music is a domain that where long range coherence is important. So repeated motifs um, and sort of harmonic changes happen over long periods of time. So this is a domain where long context is important. And what we see is that. Um, is that if you train the model on this domain, it get consistently gets better um, log likelihood performance, but it also produces very high quality and coherent long-term samples. So I'm gonna play um, just a, um, a one minute selection from a seven minute um, sample that was produced by this model. So you can hear that the model is able to maintain uh, the sort of rhythmic motif all the way through, but introduce gradual variations that make musical sense. And the reason it's able to do this is because every note that's generated by the model is conditioned on every other note that's, that's come before it. So the model doesn't forget what happened earlier on, but is able to literally attend to every, uh, every input that's, that's preceded it. And so that we find that the, in general, this is able to produce samples that have very, very high levels of coherence. Now, one of the interesting things that we can do with this model is because um, we um, uh, we basically have trained this model so that the input cross attention views um, everything in the past, but self attention um, is uh, um, is uh, something that we um, we can increase as as we um, uh, from train to test time. So um, the way that we do this is by increasing the number of um, the number of latents that are active by allowing many more points in the past to be sort of included in this attention. And um, what we see if we do this um, is that if we use the same number of um, the same number of, number of latents, which in, induces the same amount of compute at train and test time, we produce samples like this on ImageNet. So this is 1,024 latents, which is what we've seen at train. So we get um, a, a bits. Uh, we get log likelihood scores that are um, 3.42, 3.4, which are the state of the art numbers, um, and it's relatively slow to sample because of the the amount of compute that's required here. We can also um, use fewer um, fewer latents at test time by um, restricting the self attention window to only include in uh, in this illustration uh, two of those latent units. But in, in practice, um, we would do something like uh, sixteen. And um, what we what the model produces are samples that are comparable in both in quality and in log likelihood scores to state of the art models from two or three years ago. So this is um, these these samples look very much like what a Pixel CNN or Pixel RNN would produce, um, but it's it's comparably faster to sample. And we can also dial up the compute that we use at test time by allowing, uh, by increasing the window of self-attention to include many more latents. And what we find is that the model produces um, qualitatively better results that have marginally better log likelihood scores, but also um, require more uh, uh, proportionally more time to generate. So this is something that we're uh, very interested in exploring in the future as sort of a way to optimize models for the amount of um, the amount of compute that's available at test time rather than at train time. Uh, and this is a generalization property that, that falls out of the model even without training for it uh, specifically. <laughs> 
Uh, so just, just to sum up, um, uh, Perceiver AR. So this is a model that um, allows us to uh, decouple the input link from the compute and memory re requirements of um, uh, at generation time while still producing autoregressively correct um, outputs. So we can train this um, as, a, as, a, as a standard generative model. Um, and um, the, the resulting architecture produces very good results on a, on a, ver on a, a wide number of long context uh, modeling domains. Um, and as a plus, it's um, very simple to implement. Um, the, um, it, if you have a standard uh, decoder-only transformer uh, for generative modeling uh, set up, you just need to replace uh, the, the initial self-attention layer with a, with a mass cross-attention layer. Uh, and we are, um, we are in the process of open sourcing this, um, so the, the model and the weights will be available. Um, uh, sh they should be available soon. Um, I also wanted to highlight um, some other recent work that we've done on developing the, the perceiver line of work. So um, the hierarchical perceiver is a, another paper that we put on archive a couple of months ago. And again, we're, um, the, we're open sourcing the weights. This should be available soon. But this is um, a more efficient version of perceiver AR that um, keeps the generality. So it's, um, it's an architecture that basically combines repeated applications of this latent cross attention and uses low dimensional position encodings, shows how to make them work um, for um, uh, which, so in very large inputs, um, the position encodings can actually become the bottleneck. So we had to make them smaller to be able to scale this uh, to very large uh, mega megapixel scale images. Um, but the resulting model um, obtains state-of-the-art results on audio set classification using raw audio and video as input. So there's no spectrograms, no patching at the input. It's, it's actually just raw inputs. Um, and um, because, um, again, we're able to decode at the, at the pixel level here, we can get um, segmentation results like the ones that are shown here um, that have very, very fine specificity. So because we're decoding each of the pixels independently rather than uh, relying on a convolutional upsampling to decode them. Um, and the resulting architecture is um, faster and more memory efficient than and ResNets even on dense tasks like segmentation. So we think this is a, this is a very promising um, way to handle a very large uh, arc, uh, inputs that are drawn from many domains. Uh, and just to highlight um, uh, before wrapping up, a, a couple of other um, recent applications of perceivers. Um, so uh, many of you have probably seen the DeepMind's Flamingo um, architecture that was released, um, or that was uh, the paper that was released last week. And uh, this architecture uses a perceiver to, um, to uh, basically um, map um, the output of a vision encoder to the inputs of a language model as a way to um, basically uh, allow the architecture to learn the relationship between vision and text. Um, and so this is basically um, a very simple um, way to use these sorts of architectures because it gives us a way to relate um, things from one domain to, um, to another domain using a learned latent space as sort of the mediating factor. Um, the same architecture can be used for um, to uh, to encode uh, inputs that have very different semantics, such as um, uh, input images and um, abstract representations of geometrical properties. And so, this was work that was explored by um, by a, a really great intern in um, in the, at the vision team at DeepMind over the past year. And so, I recommend checking this out if you want to, if um, you're interested in sort of more um, more um, exotic applications of these sorts of models. Um, and of course, this work was done with um, a, a large number of collaborators, um, many of whom were shown here. And so the, the Perceiver and Perceiver IO were done um, at, uh, at DeepMind, and the Perceiver AR work was done in collaboration with, um, with some of our friends at, uh, at Google Brain in, um, in California. Um, and so with that, um, I'll wrap up and um, open the floor to questions. Uh, thanks very much. Fantastic talk, Julie. Thanks so much for that. Um, OK, so I can see we have a couple of questions. Um, keep them coming. Um, audience members, um, and now, uh, and also just to remind you, if you put your hand up, then we will unmute you so you can ask your question yourself, which just makes things a lot more interesting, we think. Um, so please do put your hand up, um, and then I'm going to hand over to Alessio to, uh, to, to handle the QA session. Thanks, Alessio. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, so, um, yeah, there are a couple of questions uh, from the audience. Um, no one has raised their hand, so I can ask them myself. Uh, so one other question from Mason is, um, you touched on, on this a bit by saying that you're in the process of open sourcing it, but what do you feel is preventing the perceiver from seeing a broad adoption? Uh, is it because the code has not been open sourced yet or because of other uh, perhaps issues like sample efficiency or um, not having pre-trained models or something else. 
Yeah, so the um the I, I will say the perceiver the perceiver IO model and weights um has been open sourced. So there's um we there's um on the on the DeepMind uh, GitHub repo, you'll find the um the the actual model code and the the weights. So definitely check those out if you're interested. There's also an implementation in uh, the PyTorch uh, in PyTorch by Hugging Face. So it's supported by Hugging Face. Um they, they uses our weights. So if you're using PyTorch, I definitely re recommend checking that out. Um so the um they and they have a very nice documentation as well. So it, and for PyTorch users, that's a that's an easy way to do it. Our, our code is in JAX. Um, so I think the um, um, there's, a, there's a couple of things here. So um, in terms of um, efficiency, um, the vision transformer and, for example, the SWIN transformer line of work, um, for vision-specific tasks, they are more efficient than the perceiver I.O. line of work. So this is something that we are trying to address um, in the hierarchical perceiver. So that architecture ends up being comparable or faster than, than those domains while still, uh, than, than those specific uh, architectures, while still having um, the, um, the, the sort of any modal benefits of perceiver. Um, so I think the um, there, there's a combination of um, first mover advantage and uh, scalability for vision specific applications that have led to the perceiver not being used as widely. The thing that we um, that really what I think of as sort of the killer application for these this line of work are is really problems where you would normally use a transformer but want it to want it to scale more generally. Um, and so this can include many scientific domains or problems where um, we don't you don't have like a good way to produce the kinds of tokenizations that you would need. So in vision, we know that patches work reasonably well. They're definitely a good thing to use. Um, and in, in point of fact, if you're interested um, in the perceiver IO work, we do show um, what happens when you use tokenizers. So there's, there's, there's often there's a best of both worlds sort of solution available um, if you care about something in vision specifically. Can I ask a okay. follow-up question? I'm sorry. Uh, let's yeah. um, but Joe, I, I guess this, I, I was actually surprised that you said that, that, that you said what you just said. I, I was guessing that you're going to say that because it's, these models are so inherently multimodal that you would be really outperforming other architectures on things like visual question answering and image captioning, things like that. Is that is that the case? Well, so um, the perceiver itself, you know, is is being used. It's a it's part of the backbone of the Flamingo architecture. So in that sense, it is um, it is contributing to this. The thing that we've seen consistently is that um, uh, in in domains like vision, um, if you can exploit um, a sort of locality structure, if you know the right way to use it, it's 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 a little bit silly to throw it away. So um, so I, I I do think the best options here are to use a combination of both things. So if you're able to exploit local 2D convolutional structure, by all means use it. But then when you're reconciling that with sort of things that are coming from other domains, use an architecture that can support both of them natively. Uh, okay, so um, if, um, if I understood what you said correctly, you, um, you're suggesting that in tasks where locality is probably more important or uh, has more information rather than have, um, having a global context, uh, convolutions are expected to perform uh, better or at least currently uh, than preceding. Not, not quite. I'm saying use both of them. So, um, so the, way, the way that you can do this is basically by, um, for example, um, using uh, uh, local features in terms of what you're, to, in terms of how you're tokenizing, but after that, um, pass it into an architecture that can sort of handle it generally. So um, we, what the, the, the general sort of pattern that we've observed is that if you can incorporate both of those information, both of those sets of information as flexibly as possible, you'll be better off to learn in a data efficient and scalable way. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, Eckhart asks, uh, uh, on, uh, on a previous slide, you um, show the comparison of BERT and the perceiver with or without using tokenizers. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so is there still value in using tokenizers? Uh, you mentioned that there are more details in the paper, but maybe you can give us a bit uh, of context. So um, I think tokenizers are valuable um, specifically because they do reduce the, the, um, the input size by a factor of four, and they give you um, more options in terms of actually how you're pre-processing your data. Um, the in in sort of reasonably and reasonably sized um, inputs, um, 
what the, the, um, what the Perceiver IO work suggests is that you don't need tokenizers. And so tokenizers can be, um, depending on the exact uh, data pipeline that you're working on, they can become like quite an onerous uh, burden for maintenance. So um, they're often pre-trained on some corpus. And so you, um, if that corpus changes or it's no longer appropriate for the thing that you're looking at, you have to retrain the tokenizer. And in large scale code bases, actually maintaining a tokenizer can become quite difficult. Um, so this gives you a way to not require that. Um, but if you are in the setting where you have very, very long inputs, so um, so book length or um, you know uh, corp, um, corp, corpi that are that are um, constructed of like many, many data, set, uh, many, many um, documents strung together, it may still be worth it to reduce the size of those. This just gives you more options for sort of handling um, handling those sorts of settings. Um, I will also say that not all domains are as um, are as nice to deal with as text. So if you're dealing with um, if you're dealing with scientific domains, um, for example, it's often not clear how to tokenize something. So um, this this basically gives you a way to not have to do that um, in settings where it's not clear how you would. Okay. Um, and uh, like I still asks, uh, long range coherence could allow for la large language autoencoders that can retell entire stories or chapters. Uh, so how long can the sequences uh, be for reasonable good results? Uh, is this? Yes. Um, perhaps constrained by computational uh, reasons, or uh, is there some uh, degradation that comes with long sequences, even if you can afford to compute them? Yeah, so I think, um, uh, um, I think the answer in the long term will be as much context as you can get will be better. Um, but right now, for now, there's there's very much a trade-off between the amount of contextualization you can do and the compute requirements, or sort of the memory demands of doing that. Um, so one thing I think that would be quite interesting to explore would be um, uh, versions of this architecture where we allow the context to be sort of explicitly propagated to later layers in the architecture. And doing this becomes very, very difficult. So it becomes the computational bottleneck um, with the, the sort of the current set of architectures that we have. So um, we, we allow the architecture, the perceiver AR architecture to attend to the full context only at the input layer. And the reason for this is that it becomes, it becomes very, very expensive to do this multiple times. But um, if, if compute requirements um, weren't as, as extreme, you could do this over and over again. And I would expect that the model would be able to exploit long context even more. Um, so I, I really think this is very much an open question, but I expect that models that can attend to longer context um, to greater degrees and more flexibly through, their, through depth are ultimately going to be the ones that win. Right. So um, it is currently mostly a computational uh, constraint, rather. That's right. Yeah, that, yeah that, that's interesting for future directions. Um, ben also asks, uh, have you looked into how you outperform the competition for byte-based NLP? In particular, is a wider window better able to deal with typos in the text? Uh, I guess this ties with uh, what we talked about locality uh, previously, perhaps. So um, the short answer is um, we we haven't done extensive comparisons between um, the uh, other models that were proposed sort of concurrently or subsequently for byte based NLP. I think this would be a really interesting study to put together. There's a there are a number of uh, papers that have proposed to um, handle this either by um, increasing the the sort of the scaling of transformers themselves, which is sort of um, essentially what we're doing, or by introducing other sort of um, uh, local structures, for example, um, using uh, local convolutions or using um, using sort of encoder decoder uh, bottlenecked uh, transformers transformers to sort of scale them to, to, to bigger inputs. We haven't looked at this um, in depth. I, I do think it would be interesting. Um, in terms of dealing with typos, this is, um, this is actually, I think, a problem, a, a, a particular point where, um, where the lack of tokenizers could actually be a benefit. Because um, rather than having to have the typos corrupt um, you at the, t at the word level or the subword level, they only corrupt you at the character level, uh, potentially, which um, could make it easier for the model to cope with that. But we haven't looked for this specifically, but I, but I suspect those sorts of effects will pop out. Uh, right. Um... Gareth asks, uh, how many parameters do the largest models have, uh, do you have trained so far? And how do they compare with uh, large models like GPT-3 or Palm? Yeah, so these, these models are, um, haven't been scaled anywhere close to that scale yet. This is something um, that we are thinking about, but um, the, the largest models in the Perceiver AR paper are around 700 million parameters. So they're, they're relatively small in terms of, um, in terms of that, um, that literature. 
and the uh, the perceiver I/O architectures. So we typically are and have been applying them to domains um, that are uh, very much uh, data data bottlenecked. So um, so uh, just training on sort of standard uh, image classification and these sorts of domains. Um, and so scaling models on those without doing very very extensive uh, pre-training um, will leads to just dramatic overfitting. So they these they tend to be quite small. But this is this is something I, I think this is a very it's a very interesting direction. Okay, thank you. Um, there are some more questions. Uh, I, again, I encourage uh, people to raise their hands if they want to ask them, uh, ask the question themselves, uh, which I think would be more interesting. Um, so where would the perceived architecture evolve uh, next, in particular with uh, improvement in complexity? Uh, so you said that there's an M, M times N complexity uh, currently. Uh, what, what do you think will be the, the evolution? Yeah, so the um, um, the um, definitely um, I, I think the, the the sort of the latest on this um, from our point of view is the um, the work that was done in the hierarchical perceiver and the complexity there is um, big O of M N divided by K. So we basically use a grouping operation to sort of split the input into K groups. Um, right now, this is done in a, in a fairly heuristic way, so it's effectively just slicing arrays um, to get the, the grouping structure. And this does um, this does allow you to get sort of a linear reduction in terms of the um, the compute and memory complexity. Um, but um, ultimately, I think we're, we're going to need um, sort of more dynamic um, sort of routing, um, learned routing um, grouping operations um, to to sort of keep those complexity um, those complexity constraints, but allow the model to sort of more flexibly reason about um, what it wants to attend to together. Um, so this is this is I think the um, this is I think the most promising direction for where this will go. Um, and now that things are linear, um, you really um, I don't think there's really the, the, um, there's not that much scaling that can be done um, without making some compromise in terms of how general it can be. So I, I think we're we're sort of hitting an edge here, but there are there are there are I'm sure a, a lot of um, small tricks that will that we'll need to figure out. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a bit of a uh, technical question myself. Uh, in one of the last slides, you mentioned that there was some uh, sensitivity to the uh, dimension, um, uh, to, to the number uh, of uh, latent, um, to the dimension of the latent uh, size um, uh, layers. Uh, so how how sensitive is the model to that? Is that a hyperparameter that you need to carefully tune? And uh, if so, how, how do you do it? Do you, have you uh, just experimented with some values or have you done some um, research or other uh, he, uh, optimization uh, that um, highlights some correlation between that number and maybe the task at hand? Yeah, so the um, uh, no, it's, a, it's a it's a good question. So um, uh, in practice, we often just use sort of um, five twelve or ten twenty four as sort of default as default numbers, and they they tend the model tends to work um, reasonably well just to, generically across domains. Um, you can think of that um, the number of latents is basically corresponds to. Um, uh, it, it's directly proportional to the amount of compute that you have per layer because it ends up you end up being par you're parameterizing a, a transformer in abstract space, and so you're you're saying okay how many units of my transformer do I have that can that can um, that can compare each other uh, um, that can sort of um, compare to each other, um, and so the, the main thing that um, the main thing that tends to happen is that um, if you make that larger, um, the model tends to become it becomes more powerful, but it also overfits more. Um, and so in general, depending on the domain that you're looking at, um, it's, it's really a question of figuring out um, the scale that you can sort of constrain by the amount of data that you have. And if you're not in the data constrained setting, um, it's really, it, it just comes down to um, how, much, um, how much compute can I afford? So the, those are sort of the, the two, I think the two ways of thinking about it. Um, even, even relatively small numbers um, can, can work quite well for smaller scale tasks. I can um, perhaps ask a related question. You, you, I, I think one of the really interesting things is that, that you said earlier that the perceiver allows us to have quite deep networks. Um, this linear scaling really opens things up there. So how, what does that buy you? I mean, I, I mean, have, how much work have you done on, on, on looking to see what difference it, it makes to have a huge, you know, really deep network? Yeah, so the, the thing that we, um, the, um, the setting in which we pushed this the furthest was on the autoregressive work. Um, so there, um, in that setting, we generally found that the performance was increasing with increasing depth. So the model was stable to, to quite large architectures. So this is um, 60 to seven, 60, 70 um, uh, uh, 
transformer blocks uh, in general, which is quite large um, in the sort of the, the typical um, the typical depth regimes you saw, you see. And um, we found that the model did better as you as you added more depth. Um, and so I, I think it's one of these things where there is ultimately going to be, um, if you're looking at the full um, hyperparameter space that you have to search here, there's a width and depth trade-off for sure. But um, but in general, depth becomes linear with the way these are these things are set up. Um, whereas um, if you increase the width, it's quadratic. Mm -hmm. And so usually it's cheaper. It ends up being cheaper just to, to just increase the depth. Um, I would expect that there are points, there are multiple points in hyperparameter space for any sort of architecture, um, sort of sort of any any sort of problem using this architecture that are going to be about the same in performance. So really, it's about sort of figuring out the about ba the right balance for uh, the downstream performance and the specific way you have you have it configured for the compute that you get. Um, but I think that the cool thing about this is that all of this is in play. So there are many more options that you can try to sort of maximize performance on a given domain. And how much fiddling around do you need to do with, with looking at shared weights, uh, 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 considering those kind of questions? Yeah, so in the um, in the in the the current version, so in the initial version of the perceiver, we had we we sort of shared blocks of weights. Um, we haven't been doing that in follow up work. We generally found it wasn't as important as we initially thought. Um, so the main kind of sharing weights that you have to do are just the, the basically the one D convolutional tiling that you have um, sort of in normal transformers. Um, uh, but but really, um, I I, um, I wouldn't worry about shared weights unless you're in a in a very very data impoverished regime. In that sort of setting, it can help. But otherwise, there's usually no benefit to doing it. Thank you. Um, there is uh, someone who raised their hands in the audience, but there is no question, uh, so I'm not sure if that is. Uh... Yeah, I think we need a question. <laughs> it's time your question. And raise your hand at the same time. Um, a question that we, we have received is, um, how do you uh, initialize the query later in the race, so the first one? Um, is that yeah. trained or? Yeah, so they are trained. They're all fully trained. They basically behave like weights. So they're um, they're randomly initialized with just a truncated Gaussian. Um, so it, um, we've we fiddled with a, um, several different ways of initializing it. And nothing really improved on that basic way of doing things. Um, so yeah, uh, the, I think the right way, the right intuition for thinking about them is very much like an RNN initial state, sort of in the in the in the days when people were using uh, LCMs everywhere. Um, so they're just sort of an initial position or a bias that's updated um, as you as you sort of add to it um, in later stages of the attention. Uh, right. And I want to ask, um, you um, showed the uh, performance on uh, a lot of different tasks. Um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, you haven't mentioned uh, object detection. Um, is that, uh, have, you, have you tried applying the procedure there uh, or are there limitations that uh, should be solved before applying this model in that setting? Uh, yeah, so I think it um, uh, it, it basically um, there's no um, bounding box detection isn't um, something that we've that we've um, that we've pushed on um, uh, really at any depth, but um, I don't think there's anything intrinsic that's preventing um, preventing the model from being used there. Uh, in point of fact, um, the architecture itself is it has um, it, it's of the same family as the debtor model, the debtor um, class of uh, object detection models. So the um, the latent the learned latents here look very much like the object queries that are used in debtor. Um, the the overall overall architecture ha, um, has some differences, but they're, they're they're quite similar in that respect. And so I don't I don't sort of see any anything preventing it from being used there. All right. Okay. Um, then I think that we are running out, out of time, so uh, uh, I'll give the word to Martin to wrap uh, the meeting up. Thanks, Alessio, and thanks once again, Drew. Really, really interesting talk and fantastic discussion as well. Um, just to let the audience know that this talk is recorded um, and the discussion is recorded, so um, you can find the YouTube channel, it's London Machine Learning um, on YouTube. And um, yeah, thanks to sponsors, Evolution AI, and thanks once again to True, and I'll see you all next time. Thank you. Thanks, True. Bye-bye. Thank everyone. you. Bye-bye.